in the area of both spacecraft dynamics and controls. She earned a her bachelor's degree at Virginia Tech in 2007. All right, well, uh, thank you for coming to my talk today. I'd like to uh, talk to you guys about the stability control of the flex spin docking interface for spacecraft. Um, I'd also like to acknowledge my co-author, my advisor, Mason Tech. All right, so first I'd like to start with some technologies that we see in that we see being developed for future space systems. So for example, uh, on-orbit refueling, this is the Orbital Express here, um, is designed to increase the life of spacecraft so that they are not limited by what expendables they can carry on board. We also have formation flying, which is over right here, um, where a lot of different spacecraft modules interact in tandem to produce something better than one model one could do. Uh, we also have on-orbit repair. This is a very spacecraft that is designed to be able to go to a spacecraft and actually uh, repair something or perhaps even upgrade a module so that you can again extend the life of the spacecraft. And something that's currently um, in use right now is an autonomous transfer vehicle. Here's Jules Byrne. Uh, this is something that is in use now but will become increasingly important in future space systems. One thing that all of these are uh, related by is something known as rendezvous docking a spacecraft. So rendezvous and docking a spacecraft is a very complex maneuver with a lot of high risks because you're basically getting two spacecraft that are very expensive and potentially have crew on board near each other. And if you're not very careful about your control and your stability of the system, uh, you can have collisions that cost millions of dollars um, or possibly even loss of life. So this is something that would happen, um, for example, on the DART mission where there was a collision because of the failure in their uh, examination control uh, software package. And so uh, the risks are pretty high. Now there are five um, phases to rendezvous and docking uh, maneuver. The first is obviously launch, so you get your spacecraft up there. Then you have phasing, which is where you get the spacecraft into the same orbit plane. And then you have far range rendezvous, which is basically characterized by absolute coordinates uh, for each spacecraft, but they're in the same plane and can even approach each other. You have close range uh, rendezvous, which is characterized primarily by now you're going from absolute coordinates to relative coordinates. So you can have your target and your chaser spacecraft describe relative to one another because they're in a close enough range of that's the case. And finally, you have the actual mating and docking. So this is where you ex mechanically extend the boom or you finish your, uh, your docking interface there if that's something that your spacecraft is designed to do. So the purposes of this talk, we're going to be actually focusing on the close range rendezvous section of this uh, particular maneuver. So this is, again, where we have relative coordinates between our chaser and our target spacecraft. And we assume that we've already gotten into an orbit where we're very close to the spacecraft at, at hand, but we're not actually touching it. So um, to look at this a little bit more closely, there are really four key parameters that are related to close uh, proximity rendezvous. We want to make sure that you have uh, safe failure modes. So this is it's pretty self-explanatory. If you have a cutout in your guidance and navigation system where an actuator fails, you really want to make sure that your system will go to a safe configuration. You want it to be dynamically responsive. By that, I mean I, you want it to be able to respond to the environment that it's in, and you also want it to be able to do obstacle avoidance, to be able to account for um, things you may not have uh, modeled in simulation. Uh, so you'd like it to be able to do that. Uh, you'd also like to have some kind of optimized performance. So this is something um, where you'd like to have fuel minimization, or maybe a time of your actual maneuver minimized. Uh, so that's an, uh, uh, something we're looking for. And finally, you'd like to have some kind of guarantee for stability. Uh, obviously, you'd like to have some kind of conditions in when your system will be stable, and you'd like to make sure that uh, you don't violate those conditions. So what we're proposing in this paper is a, something called a flux pin docking interface, which is a, something to augment a close, uh, close proximity uh, rendezvous maneuver that uh, is a technology that involves magnets and, and superconductors, basically. So the, the basic concept is that one spacecraft would have a magnetic array on it of magnets and electromagnets, magnets, and then the other, uh, the other spacecraft would have a type 2 superconductor on it. Because of this, we can actually exploit something known as magnetic flux pinning. And magnetic flux pinning is a, an interaction between certain uh, strengths of magnets and type 2 superconductors. This here is a disk about hockey puck sized of yttrium barium copper oxide, or YBCO. Um, and why we, and uh, flux pinning has been explored in many different uh, superconducting physics and for maglev trains because of some really interesting properties. So the first of which um, is critical here is that it occurs below a certain critical temperature. So uh, material dependent critical temperature. So in this particular case, this YBCO has a critical temperature of 88 Kelvin. And this is something that you could achieve if you had some kind of um, uh, sun shield or if you just kept it out of the direct sunlight on a spacecraft. This is pretty common. Um, and if you did have a direct sunlight, you could actually uh, use a, a small cryocooler if you needed to. 
We also have passive fixed degree of freedom stability in a nonlinear potential well. So in this figure here, you can see if this back uh, dark gray area is a superconductor that you flux pin a magnet to, you get this kind of behavior right in front of the superconductor, um, where this here is a potential well that you fixed by setting the equilibrium position. Uh, as you can see, it's very nonlinear, so as you get closer to the superconductor between the magnet and the superconductor, the forces get increasingly strong, so they repel each other more strongly here back to the equilibrium position. But I hear there's a much more shallow uh, potential well, so you can actually detract, uh, detach the two modules um, when you want to. Excuse me, when you want to. Uh, it also has some interesting properties with thermal and magnetic actuation. So for the thermal actuation, the superconductor seeks to, to maintain the flux that it saw when it crossed below its critical temperature. And it will stay in that equilibrium until you warm it up. So once you've warmed it up above its critical temperature, it erases all memory of the flux in the superconductor, and you can reset an equilibrium that you now choose and cross it again below its critical temperature, and therefore you've thermally actuated it to a different equilibrium. Um, you can also magnetically actuate it. So here I have a sample of two, uh, two spacecraft. Uh, one has a series of magnets, so there's some two permanent magnets and electromagnets here. And this here is a, a legacy of disk. And the idea is that because the superconductor is attempting to maintain the flux distribution that it saw during that transition period um, at its critical temperature, that if you add magnetic flux in the system by either increasing the current um, of a, an electromagnet or, decre or decreasing the current, um, it'll actually change the equilibrium position that you can get in between the spacecraft. So if you decrease the magnetic flux, for example, the equilibrium will become closer because it's trying to seek to maintain that same strength of uh, magnetic flux it originally saw. Now the range for this is actually very close. So I have a video here of a flux pin, the YBCO, and magnet. Uh, this is in a bath of liquid nitrogen, which is at 77 Kelvin, well below its critical temperature. My colleague here is poking at it to show you that it's got significant damping and many degrees of freedom. Uh, the one exception being the symmetric degree of freedom here, you'll actually see it spin in just a minute. Uh, it's not constrained in that degree of freedom because it is axisymmetric, and the superconductor doesn't see any difference in the flux around that axis. So it doesn't seek to resist any changes there. Um, this is actually occurring for something a hockey puck sized, is occurring on the order of about a centimeter for very strong flux spinning, but we can see effects out to about 10 centimeters. So let's go back to the flux pin document interface. So the idea here is, again, that we're trying to bring something in from uh, far away. They're on the same orbit already. And once they get within a very close range, again, for something this size, we're talking on the order of um, centimeters. But you can scale this up, and I can talk about that the questions if you're interested. Um, but yeah, so, so we're bringing it in to a very close range. Once we've gotten to that range, it will establish a, a stable equilibrium in six degrees of freedom if you design it so. And uh, then you can actually extend your mechanical arm or your remover or whatever is going to connect them to uh, the two modules. Now for passive flux spinning, where you just have a permanent magnet and a superconductor, you really only get two of the four desired characteristics that we're looking for here. You get the safe failure mode. If you design it correctly, the, the system will always return to that equilibrium that you've set and you've chosen that equilibrium position by how you decided to flux spin it originally. So uh, known as field blade. So uh, if you make sure that that configuration is safe, then you have a safe, a safe failure mode. Even in the absence of any kind of actuation, you can get it to come back to this particular position. You also get uh, a guarantee of stability within certain constraints uh, depending on the energy of the system. And so your, your stability comes again from the fact that you've got this nonlinear potential well that it seeks to, to re-enter into. Unfortunately, we don't get these two with just a passive flux pin system. We really would like to be able to optimize the system and be able to dynamically respond to things and not just passively go to whatever position we picked uh, well ahead of time before we've been able to characterize everything. So as a result, we're also looking into actively controlled flux spinning. But by actively controlled flux spinning, what I mean is we're wrapping a controller on top of the flux spinning that we already have by, by means of an electromagnet, where we change the current through the electromagnet and uh, then are able to adjust the equilibrium and change how the system behaves as a result. This particular paper was especially looking at this guarantee of stability. Now, you do have it for a passive system, but you want to make sure that when you put a controller over top of this, that you don't drive the system as unstable. So we're specifically looking at this particular thing, but I'll, I'll discuss how we're going to address some of these others later on. So if we're looking at the stability of the flux pins uh, docking interface, we really need to worry about two things. We need to have our layout of some stability conditions. We need to have a model of our system that we can apply those to and get some kind of stability condition out of it. So first I'm going to briefly go over the Lapidoff stability conditions. Uh, Lapidoff stability theory is basically a um, 
a way to look at, especially nonlinear systems, that does work for linear, obviously. Um, so you get condi uh, sufficient conditions for stability, but in this general case, it doesn't necessarily imply convergence. There are a few additional constraints you have to worry about. But in, um, basically, the, the gist of it is if you're in the neighborhood, you start out in the neighborhood, you stay in the neighborhood. That's kind of a general gist of uh, stability here. Um, and so what you generally try to do is you try to seek a Lyapunov function that characterizes your system, and then you try to, sh if you can prove that it is a Lyapunov function through a series of proofs that I'm going to submit, then you've shown that your, your system is stable in the sense of, in the sense of Lyapunov, again, with this kind of caveat that it doesn't necessarily imply convergence without a few extra caveats. So Lyapunov function characteristics really requires three things. Uh, you have to have a positive definite uh, function about its equilibrium point. You have to have continuous partial derivatives, and you have to have that the derivative of your Lyapunov function is negative semi-definite. So basically along the path it doesn't increase. 